sanctuary that you're sitting in, this building you're sitting in, is actually the sort of the fourth sanctuary in the history of Green Acres Baptist Church. The first is over, we now refer to it as C101, it's to my left, your right. That was the very first sanctuary of Green Acres Baptist Church, the first meeting house. And to my right, your left, in what is now the nursery and preschool wing, that was the second sanctuary of Green Acres Baptist Church. At least all the way up, if you, if you go down the ramp from the entrance into the nursery preschool wing, the double doors <clears throat> you walk through just past the sanctuary into the preschool wing, that's where the wing used to stop. And then <clears throat> the building you're sitting in now, the, the shell of this building was the third sanctuary opened in 1977. And then <clears throat> in 2009... Um, the fourth sanctuary, which is still this building, but it was completely gutted and rebuilt again, was the fourth sanctuary. In April of 1977, on a Tuesday, the Warner Robins Daily Sun, that particular edition, that Wednesday edition, tells the story of an explosion that took place in what was the second sanctuary of Green Acres Baptist Church. Ironically, the church was just a few weeks from moving into this building, to, to moving in its very first service of this new building. You see in front of you, on the bottom picture was this sanctuary when it was first opened in 1977. Just above that was the explosion that took place several weeks before moving in here, and beside it is an article out of the Daily Sun said the explosion was a gas leak. It blew out the entire end of the building on a Tuesday evening. I began to, I've talked to several people who are members of Green Acres Baptist Church who, have, who were around at that time. I know there was, I believe, Miss Pauline said, a wedding that had just taken place prior to that. Of course, there was Sunday service. That, if it had happened that next night... Choir practice would have been taking place. Choir practice would have been happening probably almost exactly where the explosion took place. Very interesting. The number of lives that would have been so radically altered had there been a meeting in that building when that explosion took place. Had people have been here, had the choir been practicing, the church been meeting for prayer meeting, <clears throat> had the wedding been taking place, and yet that night took place just two or three weeks before the church was to move into this building. Of course, the first worship service in this building was moved up several weeks after the explosion and the destruction. Some may call it coincidence. And some may call it happenstance. I use a different word. I call it providence. The word providence is a word which refers to the working of God, kind of behind the scenes, if you will. It's God working throughout history. It's God working in our lives. It's God working through the culture in ways that we may or may not notice, and yet the outcome is unmistakable. God has a plan. And make no mistake about it, God will direct His plan. You can be with Him or you can be against Him. But make no mistake, He will fulfill His plans. We have been following the life of a great hero named Abraham all the way since back in Genesis chapter 12. We said goodbye to him last week, but not completely. <laughs> Because the seed of Abraham continues on. Here's the interesting part. This morning, we're going to take a look at a passage of Scripture in Genesis chapter 25 that I'm referring to as God will direct His plan. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to that passage, by the way. Genesis 25. 
Just hold, hold tight there, and I'll give you more instructions in just a moment. Genesis 25. Beginning in Genesis 12, all the way through the end of the book, Genesis 12 through 50 is basically about four people. Well, really it's about God. But it's about God working through four people. Genesis chapter 12 through Genesis chapter 50. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. The four patriarchs. We said goodbye to Abraham last week. When Abraham died, you'll recall God had promised him so many offspring, they would number as many as the stars of the sky. So many offspring, they would number as much as the sand, grains of sand on the seashores. That's how numerous Abraham's offspring would be. And when he died, he only had a handful of young'uns. And in fact... He only had one child that God had promised to fulfill this promise through, and that was Isaac. So for all practical purposes, all of Abraham's other children, while they were blessed, while they were taken care of by Abraham, nevertheless, they were not the ones through whom God had promised all these offspring, all these children, and by the way, all this land. The land that Abraham had been promised. He owned one small lot and a burial plot in the promised land. That was it. And so you tell me, how's God going to make all this happen? Well, as we continue in Genesis chapter 25 today, we're going to take a, a look at what I call <laughs> the scenic route. You ever take the scenic route? Some of you men, I'm not talking about getting lost, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> don't, don't try to play it off like it's the scenic route. You're just lost. You're, you're 12 roads over from where you intended to be. <clears throat> Thank goodness for Google Maps. What I'm talking about is the scenic route. When I go home to Tennessee, my, my family laughs at me because we'll go from A to B, and I'll go through C, D, and F just to get to B. Go through old roads, country roads, winding roads that I remember from a being a child up in East Tennessee just to, to look. And every time we go up there, they know we're going to get some kind of a long ride by Dad because I just I want to see. It's the scenic route. Well, sometimes God does that. He said, we say, here's God's plan, here's point A, here's point B, and yet God says, but I'm not going to go a straight line. I'm going to fulfill my will, but I'm going to do it via a route that you may not have ever considered. God's will can take a scenic route. But let me, let me, let me give you some good news. He's always behind the scenes fulfilling His plan. In Genesis 25, verses 12 through 28, let's consider God directing His plan. And, and we're going to look at it as a scenic route, if you will. God, from Abraham to Isaac, He's going to fulfill the promise, right? But how, how might we consider some of the scenes of God's work? Some, some of the scenes, some of the, the scenic routes of God working out His will. God is not obligated to go a straight line. I know the, the quickest... The, the, the quickest way from point A to point B is a straight line. The shortest distance from point A to point B is a straight line. Right? I got all that. But God is not obligated to work in a straight line. God will work however He wants, but He will ultimately end up where He says He will. Some scenes, some possible scenes of God's working we can find in this passage. Genesis chapter 25. I'm going to begin reading in verse 12. I'm going to read through verse 28. Now this is the genealogy of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's maidservant, bore to Abraham. And these were the names of the sons of Ishmael, by their names, according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael, Nebaioth, and then Kedar, and then Abdeel, and Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadar, Tima, Jetur, Nafish, Kedemah, these were the sons of Ishmael, and these were their names. By their towns and their settlements, twelve. 
princes according to their nations. These were the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. And he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They dwelt from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt, as you go toward Assyria. He died in the presence of all his brethren. More to say about that phrase, in the presence, in just a few moments. Verse 19. This is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Isaac, or Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as his wife. You remember the story. Eliezer went and found Rebekah, brought her back to Isaac. He was 40 years old. The daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padanaram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Of course, we're going to hear more about Laban later on. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah his wife conceived. But the children struggled together within her and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? You ladies out there who are currently pregnant or have been pregnant, you know the feeling. I'll never forget when, uh, when Alyssa was... Um, was pregnant with Savannah, and uh, I was a, I was a youth director at a church here in Warner Robins, and we went to Six Flags, and uh, Savannah was was along well along enough. I don't remember how many months, but I uh, went to Six Flags and took the youth up there. And that day they had the scream machine running backwards. You ever ridden the scream machine backwards? It's a lot of fun. <laughs> and, and Alyssa, at that time in her life was a serious writer. She wrote everything. And the more babies she had, the more it made her sick. And finally she had to quit. I don't know why that happened. Anyway, so, so Savannah, however, however long Savannah had been in the womb, she was there long enough where you could feel her kicking and moving and that kind of stuff. And, and we decided we were going to ride the screen machine backwards. Yeah, you walk up there, there are 12 signs. If you are pregnant or heart patient, or whatever, you don't need to be riding this ride. And so... We were fairly young parents at the time, and so she decided she wanted to ride it. And even our youth were going, Miss Alyssa, I don't know this is a good idea. So, Got on the screen machine, rode it backwards, and we got finished, and we stopped, and she just sat there. She said, oh, I don't feel so good. <laughs> and she had never had trouble with riding rides before, and i got to tell you, Savannah didn't move for about three days. <laughs> Alyssa's calling the daughter, going, no, she's not moving. I rode a roller coaster, I don't know what's happening. Of course, everything ended up okay. But, but you, you ladies know the, the, the anxiety you feel sometimes when maybe something's not quite right. And you just know. Well, Rebecca knew. And that's what she says in verse 22. So she went to inquire of the Lord. Verse 23, And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old. Remember that. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore him. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skilled hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man dwelling in the tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Remember that too, because it causes a whole bunch of trouble in weeks to come. In this story, in, in this passage that we just read, we see what I would refer to as somewhat of a scenic route to God's will. Ishmael, who was a son born of Abraham that was not the son of promise, born of a servant, God had not really planned for Abraham to do, but in God's permissive will, Ishmael was allowed to be born and his family grows up. And then Isaac, the one born of Abraham that was to be the son of promise with this wife and all these troubles, and we see some scenes of God taking a scenic route to direct His will. And in these scenes, can I suggest to you that some of you are, you're, you're, you're trusting God for His will, but it just seems that His will is taking a scenic route in your life. 
Maybe it is it's taken such a scenic route that you're beginning to wonder if you're doing what God wants you to at all. Maybe it's taking such a scenic route that in the back of your mind, you've not told anyone, but in the back of your mind, you're just wondering, is this, is this really God working? Is, is there a God? You know, the kind of question you don't want to ask in Sunday school because you're afraid everybody will look at you as a pagan, but you're thinking in the back of your mind. Let's be real honest. Can I suggest to you that in the context of this fellowship, those kinds of questions, this, this should be the place where we feel like we have the freedom to ask those questions because we have doubts. Oh, pastor, I don't want to ask them at church. People might think I'm a, I'm a heathen. <laughs> I shared this Wednesday, and I want to share it again. Some of you heard this already, but last week we had someone call this church from another city and another church a distance away. But someone called this church about a, a very difficult situation they had with a teenager. And it seems that the teenager had come out and explained to their, uh, their mother that they believed they were uh, of the homosexual lifestyle, and the mother didn't know what to do with it. And so the mother called our church office. Different city, different church. And uh, <clears throat> talked talk a little bit and we were discussing it later. Pastor Brian and I were discussing it a little bit and I said, that, that's in interesting. Did, does she have a church home? And, and she was asked that. Do you have a church home? Yes, I do. But she, and she had not called her pastor. And as we began to talk about it, I said, you know why? Because she's afraid if she tells someone in her church folks in the church might find out of her difficulty and her trouble. i got to tell you, folks, and I shared Wednesday night this with, with the folks here at the Bible study, if there's anywhere that my prayer is you would be able to share the, the yearnings of your heart, the things that are breaking your heart. I don't mean everything needs to be shared publicly. That's not what I mean. But if, if you're, you're struggling with something, maybe you're a parent, and you're just dying on the inside because of, Maybe it's something your, your teenager's doing, your child's doing, or, or, or maybe you're just struggling because something a parent's doing and you're, you're a young person. Whatever the case might be, my prayer is that you would be able to have someone, a, a Sunday school teacher, a deacon, one of a, the pastoral staff to come and sit down and say, I've just got to pour my heart out. And this would be the place where you feel safe being able to do that. Well, as I look back on these scenes of life, I know some of you out there are struggling with scenes of life that God's working out. You're struggling with things and you're not really sure who you can talk to or go to. Can I suggest to you that as we look at some of these scenes of God's working, my prayer is that you'll be encouraged. My prayer is that you'll be helped. My prayer is that you'll leave here saying, okay, I'm not weird, I'm not odd, I'm not way off balance. There, there really are others that struggle just like I do. And maybe you would find that there's a way to, 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 to work with someone, to talk with someone, to counsel with someone while God's working out the scenic route in your lives. Consider some of the scenes of God's working. Genesis chapter 25, beginning our study in verse 12. We begin in verse 12 by being introduced to Ishmael's family. We've, we've been introduced to Ishmael, Abraham's other son of Hagar, but we haven't been introduced to his sons. Uh, it, it is no accident, it is no coincidence that Ishmael gives birth to 12 sons. If you'll go back in the Scriptures, back into Genesis 16, we'll look there in just a few moments, don't turn there now, but if you were to look back there, you'll find that God promises Hagar and He promises Ishmael Cer certain things about their family, certain things about his life, certain things about his success. And then in verse 18, it says, They dwelt from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt, as you go toward Assyria. This is a large, a large portion of land that Ishmael's family was living in with 12 sons. I want to show you something. Look at, hold your place here in Genesis 25. Flip back just for a moment to Genesis chapter 16. Genesis 16, verse 1. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. 
So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. And basically, they get rid of Hagar and Ishmael. Hagar and Ishmael are out, or at least Hagar uh, pregnant with Ishmael is out on her own. Now skip forward to verse 10. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall be counted, shall not be counted for multitude. That is, there will be so many offspring of your son Ishmael who's about to be born, you'll not even be able to count them. Now hold your place in chapter 16, all right? We're going to go back there, back and forth uh, in just a few moments. So hold your place in chapter 16. Go back to chapter 25 of Genesis. If you look at chapter 25 of Genesis, verses 12 through 17, you will see that God is, in the, in, is very busy fulfilling His promise to Ishmael. Now remember, Ishmael is not even the son of promise. Ishmael is not even the, the primary son of the lineage that will come out of Isaac, that will be uh, Jacob and Israel and the 12 tribes and Judah and David and, and eventually the Messiah. That's not even what we're talking about here. We're talking about Ishmael. And yet God, when He makes a promise, He keeps it. Not only that, but look at the last part of chapter 25, verse 18. Got that? Chapter 25, verse 18. Look at the last phrase. It says, He, Ishmael, He died in the presence of all His brethren. He died. That is Ishmael. Some of your translations read a little differently, depending on what you have. He died in the presence. The, the phrase, in the presence it oftentimes implies or directly infers taking by force. This phrase seems to indicate that Ishmael died in the presence of his brethren, but beyond that, there was, there was um, antagonism. There was conflict when he died between he and his brethren. That's interesting. Hold your place here and go back to Genesis 16. Genesis 16, verse 11. <clears throat> then the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, you shall bear a son, you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. Verse 12, this is important. Verse 12, he shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. From the very beginning, go back to Genesis 25. From the very beginning, chapter 25, verse 18 seems to indicate that Ishmael's first dwelling place, he was already in conflict with all of his neighbors. Now let me pause here for just a moment. I don't know if you read the news at all. You don't really have to. If you've watched the news for five minutes in the last 20 years of your life, or if you're not that old, if you watch the news for five minutes in the last year of your life, you'll know that Abraham's descendants and Ishmael's descendants have all migrated into the area of the world we now call the Middle East. And my friends, there is no area of the world where in the history of the world there has been more conflict, more unrest. And in an area that geographically does not take up that big of a portion of the world, and yet in that area, all the neighbors seem to be in conflict with one another. In conflict with others, well, God told Hagar a long time ago. And while it may have taken a scenic route, God's promises, whether we appreciate them or not, they will be fulfilled. And so let me suggest something to you. As we look at Genesis chapter 25, verses 12 through 19, or excuse me, verses 12 through 18, really, one of the, one of the scenes of God's working is happening between the births and the deaths of His people. And so here's the first scene. God works through the births and the deaths of His people. God works through the births and the deaths of His people. 
Now, now, don't get me wrong. The birth of someone and the death of someone generally br- brings about a very different reaction. When someone's born into my family, there's celebration. When they die, there's grieving. And yet, nevertheless, when family and friends come about a birth or a death, it is notable. And yet, God works through births and God works through deaths probably equally in many cases. Every time a life comes into this earth, a lot of things are happening. Every time a life leaves this earth, many things are happening. Anytime I do a funeral, I'm always intrigued by the person who passed, the the influence, the realm of influence they had, good or bad, on the lives of people. And how many many individual lives their life has often touched. And how what an impact it is on the family. This past week we had a funeral here and it was a, one of the patriarchs of that family passed. Well, that is a life-changing event for that family that the makeup of that family will never be the same because one of the major, uh, one of the, the, the major players and the major family members, the patriarch, has passed. And now things are changed. When, when, we, don't, when we don't fully trust in God, can I suggest to you, the death and the birth of people becomes difficult for us. Rather than recognizing, okay, I'm going to grieve over someone dying, but I still know that God's at work. I I, I may, uh, a child's born, and I may even agonize over that because I'm a parent and my child's not ready, or maybe my kids aren't ready. I I think they're too young to be having children. There may be some things that I'm, I'm wrestling with. Listen, whether a birth or a death, When we're trusting God, we've just got to know, okay, God's got a plan here. Even if the circumstances are not the best, God's got a plan. God works through the birth and death of His people, just like He's doing here in this passage, in this chapter. William Randolph Hearst, he built a newspaper empire in the late 1800s and early 1900s. William Randolph Hearst. There was an article in Life magazine years ago about Hearst said when he was 75 years old, he forbid the mention of the word death in his presence. He forbid it. However, at some point in his life, he had to allow some control of all of his publications to his lawyers. After all, he was beginning to get to the point where he was unable to handle them at his age and his physical capabilities and his faculties. He he had ruled, listen, he had ruled, uh, this was up into the 1950s, he had ruled a $200 million empire. That's a lot of money now. It was surely a lot of money back in the mid part of the 20th century. He had arrogantly ruled that. And he acknowledged death, but he wouldn't mention it. The statement, when he turned over control to much of his empire to his lawyers, here's what the statement read that Mr. Hurst had become conscious of the uncertainties of life. Couldn't stand to hear it talked about. Can I suggest something to you? When we're walking with God, the birth of someone and the death of someone looks entirely different than when we're not. So make no mistake about it, God works through the birth and the deaths of His people. Verse 20. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife. So he's 40. By the way, she's younger than him. If you go back to the story where she, she came aboard and they got married, uh, he, he was quite a bit older than her, probably 10 or 15, maybe 20 years, that that was a very normal thing back in the day. And according to verse 20, here, here was Isaac. He, he took Rebekah. Verse 21, Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife. Seem, seems to be the... Same song, different verse, doesn't it? She can't have babies. It's like, God, didn't you just do this in the previous generation? Well, sort of God did it in the previous generation. Sort of. If you will recall, Abraham and Sarah had been promised a son, and they waited a couple of decades, and they got a little anxious. So they decided that the best way to respond to to what they thought was God not answering their prayers was to do it themselves with Hagar and Ishmael. We know, we've talked about some of the issues that's created through the history. But Isaac, good news. 
according to Genesis chapter 25, verse 21, how did Isaac respond to the fact that Rebekah couldn't have a child? He prays. He said, listen, Isaac was just as aware as Abraham had been that he was the son of promise. Isaac was aware that the Messiah would, be, would come through his lineage. Isaac was aware that the nation of Israel would come through his line and his wife couldn't have a baby. Not only did she not get him to marry another woman, I think that's pretty smart of Rebecca, if you ask me. <laughs> they didn't try to short-circuit the situation. It said he pleaded with the word. that. How many of you know that word pleaded is desperation? Let me tell you something, folks. Desperate ain't so bad when, you, when it causes you to get before the Lord. Desperate ain't a bad place to be. I've seen some churches throughout, throughout my time in ministry Sometimes they, they refuse. Well, we had never done it that way before as they die on the vine. And sometimes if they get desperate enough, the church is willing to say, Brother, we'll do whatever's necessary so that God's work here doesn't die. And so desperate ain't such a bad place to be. How many by a show of hands? Can, can, how many by a show of hands would say, Pastor Johnny, I remember back in a time in my life where I got desperate. And that was actually a spiritual turning point for me. I actually got in the right place when I got desperate. How many, by a show of hands, how many of you? I know it's been true for me. On my face on the floor in the bathroom in the middle of the night, just not knowing what else to do or where else to go, crying out to the Lord. Let me tell you what God does. Not only does He work through the births and deaths of His people, but He works through the bumps and the desperation of His servants. This is a bumpy ride for Isaac and Rebecca, and they're desperate. And guess what? God works through your desperation. You know, America, America was fairly uninvolved in defeating Nazism and fascism in the late 1930s, wasn't it? What got America involved? A little bit of desperation. Not, not desperate, necessarily. I guarantee the people in Pearl Harbor were, were desperate, weren't they? And there was a reaction. And we put every bit of our resources to defeating one thing. Because we realized if, if we let this thing go, they're going to be here before long. And we just can't allow that to happen. In fact, at the beginning of World War II, some, some of you may even recall it. As young people, some of you have studied it. In the first year or so of World War II, things didn't go so well. And there was a sense of desperation. And it caused America to work even harder, to fight harder, to spend more, to work more. You know, there have been certain strides, huge strides and certain illnesses. I'll never forget back in the 1980s when the AIDS virus first came on the scene. People began to panic. There was a desperation. And guess, guess what happened? Because of the desperation, people begin to pour themselves into curing him. There, there are advances that have been made in cancer research simply because people have gotten desperate. And I'm telling you folks, you think desperate is bad? You're here today, you're desperate over something? Could I suggest to you that maybe God's finally gotten you exactly where he needs you to be? God works through the bumps and the desperation of his servants. Oh, Isaac, getting before the Lord. Oh, God, I, I, I'm not going to go marry some other woman like my daddy did. And can I suggest to you this, parents? The beauty of this is could it be that Abraham, with Isaac on his knee teaching him, with Isaac as a young man saying, Isaac, I've, I've got to talk to you about the facts of life. There may be a day when you're married and maybe your wife can't have children, but you're the son of promise. Isaac, don't marry another woman. Isaac, don't try to have a baby from another woman. You, you take that wife you're marrying and God will provide. And maybe Abraham, maybe, I'm just saying, maybe Abraham took his mistake and used it to help make Isaac learn God's will. Parents, I can suggest to you this. Uh, we made a lot of mistakes in the past, haven't we? And sometimes God will allow us to use our mistakes to help our children not make the same ones. And so God works through our bumps and desperations. And then verse 22 but the children, Rebecca's pregnant now, right? The children struggled together within her. And as I shared earlier, she got very concerned. Something's wrong. Isaac, Isaac something's wrong. They, did, they didn't have all the technology. 
They, they didn't have ultrasounds and imaging and 3D ultrasounds. That is unbelievable. If you've ever seen an image from 3D, 4D ultrasound, I mean, it's like a, it's like a high-resolution picture of that baby. It's not, back, back when, when uh, we were having children, the ultrasounds, I couldn't even tell what the baby it's a, it's a you, you know what I'm talking about, those old ultrasound pictures. It's some black and white spots. And they go, oh, here's the baby. I mean, I can't see anything. I don't see any baby. on there. Just look like a blob. And now you can see the lips and the nose and the eyes. It's amazing. Well, back then they had nothing. But women, how many of you know? Mamas, how many of you, you know something's not right? Rebecca knew. Someone right. So verse 23, the Lord answered her. Here's the answer. Here, here, here's the issue. You've got two babies in your womb, and they're, they're a big deal. They're two nations, and they're, they're going to they're gonna struggle. Um, they're going to be different. And in fact, it, one, one of the things that's going to make them so different is the older baby will actually serve the younger. Well, they're twins. Yeah, but one of them's older, right? Who's older? Huh? Okay. Hunt. How, by how long? One minute. All right. Now, I don't know if they'll ever use that growing up, but for Jacob and Esau, that was the case. And they may be twins, but Jacob and Esau are very different. Can we hear a witness here, right? And so twins may come out looking the same at times, but they're very different people. And that's what God tells Rebekah. Verse, 25, verse 24, So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. Now that's different. <laughs> that's different. He called him Esau, which means red. Afterward, his brother came. Esau would have fit well in South Georgia. Am I right? He liked to hunt. He liked to spend time in the woods. He would have driven a big truck with big tires. And he still would have had a gun rack, regardless of what the statutes were, right? And it says in verse 26, Afterward his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. The, the, the word Jacob means heel holder, tripper-upper. You want to be real honest? It means cheater, <laughs> hustler. We'll find that out. These are two very different. Esau, well... <clears throat> let's just say he wasn't the smartest kid on the block, but he was the toughest. Jacob, he wasn't much about hunting and fishing, but he was smart. Two very different people. Can I suggest to you that God doesn't work in spite of our differences. He works through our differences. Can I suggest to you, watch this, God not only works through the births and deaths of His people and the bumps and desperations of His servants, but watch this, He works through the burdens and the differences of His children. Rebecca had a burden for her children. God answers her. They're going to be different, and I'm doing it on purpose. God doesn't work in spite of our differences. He works through our differences. And by differences, I don't mean conflict and disagreement. I mean the way we look, where we're from, our backgrounds. He works through our differences. We don't always agree on things, do we? That's not a bad thing. Can I suggest to you, it's not a bad thing. The problem comes in, in the fellowship of God's people, is if we allow our different opinions to cause us to part ways in fellowship and not continue forward in God's will. So God works through our burdens and our differences. And then look at verse 27. So the boys grew. And Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. It, it, it emphasizes their difference, their differences. Jacob was a chef. Esau was a hunter. Kind of works out well, doesn't it? One kills the food, the other cooks it. Can, can I suggest to you that our differences actually make us more effective? Our diversity actually makes us more productive than less? In verse 28, and Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now there's a problem. We'll deal with that more. I'll tell you what, we'll deal with that more in weeks to come. I don't think I have to spend a whole lot of time 
discussing the fact that when, when parents have favorites, there's, it's just going to be a problem. It's going to create problems in the family. But let me suggest this to you. Verse 27 and 28, God works through the blessing and diversity of his offspring. Jacob and Esau were two very different people. Oh, wow, that's bad. No! If, if we were all the same, most of us wouldn't be necessary. If we all did the same things, if we all looked the same, if we all had the same experiences, the same ideas, the same strengths, the same weaknesses, there would be a whole big part of the church that we wouldn't even have and another part that wouldn't even be necessary for most of us. i, I got to tell you something. I believe at Green Acres Baptist Church, God is growing a church that is going to be as diverse a fellowship as there is in middle Georgia. That, that is not my point. I'm convinced that's what God's doing. We're seeing it happen. And I'm not just talking about we, had, we have different personalities. I'm talking about different personalities, different backgrounds, different economic levels, different skin colors, different racial makeups, different cultural makeups. And listen to me, it is the differences that makes us strong, not weak. It is the diversity that allows God to be more efficient and more effective through us, not less. And so if, if you're uncomfortable worshiping with someone who looks different than you, Green Acres ain't the church for you. If you're uncomfortable serving with someone who looks different from you, who has a different skin color than you, who, Green Acres ain't the church for you. Because we go all the way back to Jacob and Esau and we see God works through the diversity. You need only look at Acts chapter 13, the greatest missions movement in the history of the world. In Acts chapter 13, you don't have to turn there, but in verses 1 through 3, guess who came out of, it was, it was a church in Antioch, and they were planning on sending out missionaries, and guess who got sent out from Antioch? Two missionaries, two of the greatest ever. Who were they? Paul and Barnabas. And for three chapters, the major characters in the entire Christian world were Paul and Barnabas. And they were sent out from a church where they had eight or nine different leaders, all of them from different countries, all of them different races, all of them different skin colors, all of them different backgrounds, and that was the leadership of the church, let alone what the membership looked like, right? The greatest missions movement in the history of the world took place in Antioch because of the diversity of that fellowship, out of the diversity of that fellowship. Listen, folks, God will direct His plan. He may be taking a scenic route, but I hope in some of these scenes you saw at least in part, okay, that's a place where God's working in my life. I just felt like God had just forgotten me. I felt like God was mad at me. I felt like I wasn't in the right place, but maybe God's still working. Let me sit back and pray and see maybe he's at work. The citizens of Feldkirk, Austria, many years ago, they didn't know what to do. Feldkirk, Austria. Napoleon's massive army was preparing to attack. Soldiers had been spotted on the heights above the little town of Austria. The, uh, the heights that were situated along the Austrian border. A council of citizens was summoned, a uh, citizen leadership they were summoned to come together and they had to decide, do we attempt to defend ourselves or do we just raise the white flag of surrender? The citizen council came together and they came together on a day that just happened to be Easter Sunday. The people gathered in the local church and the pastor of that church in that town stood up and he said this, friends, we have been counting on our own strength, and apparently that has failed. As this is the day of our Lord's resurrection, let us just ring the bells, have our services as usual, and leave the matter in God's hands. We know only our weaknesses, and we do not yet know the power of God to defend us. And so they did. The council accepted the preacher's plan. The church bells rang out. The enemy, one of the great armies in all of history, Napoleon's army. The enemy heard the, the bells ringing. It was very confusing to them. Because in their minds, this should be a day 
of terror for this small town of Feldkirk. Napoleon got together with his generals and tried to determine, why are the bells ringing? That's a celebration. That's not a surrender. Napoleon and his officers concluded that the Austrian army must have arrived during the night to defend the town. So before the service ended, the enemy camp broke and left. Oh, friends, God will direct His plan. We sometimes refer to it as His providence. He's working behind the scenes. He's working sometimes in a scenic route. But He will get from point A to point B. The way He does it is up to Him. But I'm telling you, folks, it's time we begin to trust Him. I don't know what's going on in your lives. But could I suggest to you that you're here today as part of God's scenic plan? You're here today because you need to trust Christ as your Savior. You've not done that. And you're struggling with life, and I'm telling you, you're looking for answers. And I'm not saying we all automatically have every answer you need, but I am saying the beginning of your answers, it begins in a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And what if it is today that you would come and say, Pastor Johnny, I need to speak with someone about trusting Christ as my Savior. Because I, I don't have any answers for my life, but I at least need to talk with someone. Look, we're not going to force you into anything, but wouldn't you at least consider talking to someone, letting them explain what it means to be saved, and at least giving you the opportunity? You might still refuse, and that's your prerogative, but wouldn't you at least want to hear it? I would suggest to you that if you're here today and you don't know that you're saved, you're really not sure, and you refuse to even hear it, I would suggest to you you refuse because you're afraid it might be true and you'd need to respond. I would suggest to you you're just denying the fact that you really do need Christ, but you don't want to consider that today. But couldn't I just exhort you to come here in just a moment? The praise team's going to play. Couldn't I just exhort you to consider coming on forward and saying, Pastor Johnny, I need to trust Christ as my Savior, or at least I need to hear about it. Maybe you have trusted Christ. It is time for you to let somebody know about it. Come forward. Pastor Johnny, I need to be baptized. Pastor Johnny, can I talk with someone at least? Maybe it is that God's God's leading you to a church home and you're looking and you're here today. Can I suggest God didn't bring you here by accident and maybe this is the exact fellowship in which you need to serve and to worship and to fellowship and to grow? Look, I'm telling you, the New Testament knows nothing of Christians apart from a local church. It does not exist. And today's your day to come maybe become a part of Green Acres. And I'll explain to you how that can happen. We have a membership process, and we can explain. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to stand, and I'm going to invite you to respond to God's Word. Father, right now, I'm asking you to help us obey you right now in Jesus' name.